You part the waters. The same ones that I'm thirsty for. You invite your friends to tea, but when it's me, you lock the door. You got your credit cards, and you thank your lucky stars. But don't forbet the one who foots the bill. You part the waters, the same ones that I'm drowning in. I'm the one who helps you sin. You got a grand P and no, you don't even pay piano. I'm the one who plays piano. You don't even play piano. All right. You part the waters. The same ones that I. Uh, howdy, folks. I'm back once again after a break. Just letting everybody know that there will probably be some uh, a time coming up soon. Here, I'm going to be going off the grid, uh, off of uh, the socials and off of the streaming platforms and off of the podcast for a little while. Some of you know why, uh, but I'll be back. Don't worry about it. Changed, having burst forth out of a chrysalis. And become a glistening new subject. Be interesting to see how that goes. I'll have I'll report back certainly. And we're back on Friday, the way God intended it. Uh, you think you're lucky, stars. but don't forget the one. So, yeah, how's everybody doing? Don't really know how to start today. I have this vague idea of something I want to talk about, but I don't really have a hook for it, so... It's just sort of sitting there in my mind. Maybe I'll just interact with some comments to see if anything bursts forth as it often does. So if anyone has any prompts or questions, please go so I can like get off of the get off the, the starting blocks here. Oh, the Argentinian anarcho-capitalist who's about to become a uh, President of Argentina, that'll be entertaining. That'll be something to watch. I don't know how much fun it'll be in Argentina, but, you know, I, I get why it's happened, you know. Like, uh, the Peronist horizon has, has just dominated Argentina for so long that they're at the point where the only thing that's going to feel like a way out is something radically different. And that is one thing that has not been tried. Reddit libertarianism. That's the one thing that has not been part of the Peronist Big Tent at one point or another. So, of course, people are going to look at it as uh, as a way out because they are right now the inflation country. And it's very funny that they just joined BRICS because not only are they in the inflation country, which doesn't really seem like it's going to help BRICS too much, uh, they also are on the brink of electing as president a guy who promises to make the U.S. dollar the currency of the country. Basically the opposite of de-dollarization. They dollar in the fuck out of things. But they'll see if they even if he even goes for it. 
the real thing to see with him is just, you know, how far from a uh, center point of, you know, uh, reactionary Keynesianism, I don't know what you would want to call the current regime we're living under, uh, that dominates every major government. Uh, there is play on, on the edges. You can be more or less in different axes. You know, uh, Europe is more social democratic than the United States. Uh, things like that. But, and there, you know, there are countries that try to do uh, radically more like libertarian state cutting, but there's a limit to how much of that you can do. And to what extent what you do do ends up being just replacing the private, uh, the public sector with uh, a contractor uh, se uh, sector that essentially carries out the same uh, functions as the state by the state at a higher cost. That's what libertarianism often uh, creates in practice. They say, we're cutting this government thing. But then that only means is that now they got to hire people to do it because there's a reason the government was doing it. And there is also a governmental uh, element to the planning and executing of that sector. So all you end up doing by privatizing is now making it so that instead of dealing with sectors of the government, you're dealing with contractors who are taking their direction from their employers, the state. And that just decreases efficiency and increases cost, but doesn't actually do any of the things that the libertarian uh, justification would suggest, because, again, it's not actually changing any dynamics. It's not changing any uh, functions of the state. It's just making it less effective, less effective and less efficient. And that, you know, then therefore, therefore, therefore further delegitimizes government and boosts the argument of the libertarian right. It's amazing. But again, this, the premise here is that there's only fo so far you can go in that direction before you hit the hard limits of what the system requires in terms of state management of the economy, since the libertarian idea that they're separate, uh, separate machines, they're separate things is an illusion, and it's an illusion that is useful to systems as they exist. It help, it, it uh, creates uh, a consciousness within these systems that explains away all the bad parts of it without indicting any of the necessary parts of it, and it can propel those uh, groups of people into political power that can further entrench uh, that system's control. But what they can't do within the political system is... Uh, break through of the orthodoxies to the a millenniary horizons that libertarianism promises. Because libertarianism, libertarians love to imagine that they uh, are the opposite of the millenniary communists who are always trying to immunitize the eschaton. But the libertarian vision of government is as eschatological and millenniary as the left's is. Because it's all part of the same liberal middle class, basically, uh, uh, reaction to modernity's emergence and psycholo it's a psychological revulsion towards it. They want to fundamentally break things that make capitalism work. The gold standard is a perfect example of this. The gold standard, if actually implemented, would destroy overnight the entire global economy uh, in, in, an, in an apocalyptic sense. Uh, now, for the libertarians, though, true believers, they have a narrative whereby that destruction of the global economy is good. Communists have the same thing. They imagine a cumulative class war resulting in a war of positions, military and uh, political, and economic between classes that will lead to the triumph of the working class and the obliteration of this bourgeois subjectivity that leaves everyone frozen between poles, unable to act and therefore resolve their uh, spiritual sickness because actions that would actually improve 
their, not necessarily their subjective conditions, but their sense of control of their lives are forbidden. The only way they can act is as subjects, obedient subjects. So all political horizons have to have within them the annihilation of capitalism. Now, liberalism, of course, doesn't. Liberalism is the creed of, oh, you silly eschatolog eschatologists. We don't need to destroy everything. We're going to lead to a peaceful, Whiggish transfer over time of the rough timber of humanity into straight, beautiful boards. And the thing that's going to do it is development. Capitalist development. Capitalist development will soothe our aches and pains, soothe our souls, and allow us to achieve a perfect harmony. But what is the perfect harmony envisioned by libertarianism? Because again, you can't have politics without a horizon. And that has to be a cumulative and a totalizing horizon. The liberal horizon is bourgeois subjectivity for everybody in every place. The bourgeois life for all. But the bourgeois subjectivity is a schizophrenic, sadomasochistic nightmare mind that is at every moment trying to pull itself apart, trying to gnaw itself into shreds because it cannot contain the contradictions that are necessary of being the agonized subject between labor and capital, between exploitation and exploitator, between master and slave. That position can temporarily be okay if you have enough bells and whistles and a suburban lawn and uh, consumer choices, which are the actions we can take as liberal subjects. You don't feel so good in your tummy about everything? Buy this, buy that. And you can assert that sense of control over yourself. I have this pain, but it can be assuaged. And I can do the assuaging by raising bread, by becoming successful in my field, by attaining material wealth and security. And then exercising my rights as a consumer. That is driven by a lack, a, a, a hole, a void at the center of bourgeois life. And, this try, and it will never be sated and it will consume the, the globe. Liberalism assumes, not uh, consciously, but implicitly, that there will always be a miracle that intervenes to prevent that from happening. Now, this is where, once again, we're at the apocalyptic horizon for, for liberalism. They are also imagining a cumulative point where that technological eruption, that technological miracle that has saved us from ourselves every other time in modern history, from the initial capitalist response to the chronic shortages of the late Middle Ages and the Bronze and the uh, Little Ice Age, the early modern era, I'm sorry, uh, that extracted more from the land to the Industrial Revolution to the fertilizer revolution of the earlier early 20th century that allowed for a huge expansion of the human population, and then the green revolution of the 1970s that allowed that level of the human population to sustain itself in the face of Malthusian pressures. Because people forget now that in the 1970s, the big fear uh, was that the world was going to collapse, uh, but not because of climate, because of population. But not just a population boom that that fertilizer helped produce, but also uh, was now being destabilized by because there was simply not enough conventional agriculture to feed everyone. And then the Green Revolution, a bunch of huge technological innovations in agriculture that wildly increased the efficient, the uh, output of a given acre of land. Dwarf wheat. Dwarf wheat is a big part of this. If anyone watched The West Wing, there's an episode where President Bartlett raps his rhapsodic about dwarf wheat. And that was a perfect encapsulation of the West Wing. Because for a liberal, things like dwarf wheat, things like the steam engine, appear as like fucking Prometheus's fire. Appear as gods, bestowed on us not by a higher power, but by collective human ingenuity filtered through the market. So they think that we will keep getting technological innovations that let it get us to a point where every human lives 
the pleasures, but not the secret psychic pains, because those are sublimated, of middle-class life. We all get to be bourgeois, but as I said, the bourgeois mind is at war with itself, which means it cannot be stabilized. The pain of it can be reduced by consumption, but it can only be postponed. You're only pushing it back, and then as soon as mortality really enters the picture, as soon as a keen and unleaving sense of mortality enters the human mind, which it does around middle age, uh, then that becomes less and less tenable. And you see that with people who have everything, who have total, who, who live in now the idea of the liberal utopia, which is a big reason that liberalism is considered more realistic than the other uh, political traditions. Because they can honestly say that their utopia has existed in history. The, uh, the communists, uh, the libertarians can't really say that. Uh, they can claim that in time, they could accurately claim that in times the fight for these things created the conditions of like the perfected human subject, one who is not at war with himself, one who is fully and totally embodied and unified in will between body and mind and spirit, the holy goddamn trinity. That experience existed under communism in the struggle to, to uh, attain it. But in the, in the administration of it, what it doled out to people, it never did. I'm sorry, scarcity prevented that. It wasn't any fault of the communists. There was not the sufficient resources versus technology, the ratio of resources to technology in, in the places that communism held, took power was insufficient for that to happen. But liberal utopia has persisted since the dawn of liberalism. Among the... Uh, the narrators of modern history, the people who are in the pilot seat, the creative class of the middle class, the creative part of the middle class. Now, of course, that's not everybody, and it's not most producers. Most of the producers of good art come from the lower class or from the aristocracy. But the money and the social technology to disseminate art is concentrated around the middle class, le bourgeois. And then, like a mag, um, this 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 social relationship, this complex of relationships that have undergirding them money relationships that have undergirding them exchange networks, surplus circulation, and accumulation. They are dynamos of economic activity that draw, like iron filings, creative types from every class, who together create a popular culture where the human subject resides. And that human subject is not the people who uh, make the arts fantasy of them, their subjectivity. No, that is just the, the material, the light. Like that, they, they, will, they will create the, uh, the film, but the light that goes through the film comes from the mind of the consumer, because this is a consumer society defined by consumption for the first time in history, a generalized, a democratized, if you will, culture of consumption, facilitated by technology. They become the mind of the middle class that entertains itself with culture, and that in that culture is told over and over again a narrative of ultimate completion and satisfaction that comes not through class struggle or the old gods, like the conservatives, that the reactionaries want, but through the pursuit of bourgeois subjectivity. God is absent, but the pageantry of human, human experience is generated. And because it's right in front of your face every day, it becomes real in a way that the libertarian and communist utopias never can be because they've never been lived. You can say that people have lived in libertarian harmony or, and in communist harmony through history. But those lives were incredibly hard. They were miserable. They contained uh, a overwhelming amount of conflict, violence, misery. 
And the proof of that is that the social conflict that that misery created was sufficient to build this modern world and to build the chains of modernity. So we live in the in this bourgeois mind. And this bourgeois mind is again in total control of the culture, but is also schizophrenically at war with itself because it is both consumer and uh, it is both product and consumption and at this point it is both product because its value as a consumer becomes commodified or if it's a worker, its labor is commodified. So it is both commodity and commodity consumer. It is both master, because it's a middle class, which means it probably owns some sort of equity in the system, land usually, homes usually, and is connected to uh, the ruling structures through that relationship, but also has a subject precarious relationship to capital itself. Can be in solidarity with neither the poor and the exploited or with the rich and powerful. And this is the mindset that in times of crisis, becomes fascism. Because if it's deprived of the, I'm going to say the word, and you can kill me for it, but this is the only word that makes sense, treats that keep the, the misery at the heart of this life, the whole, the gap, manageable, is treats. You don't feel like uh, you're complete in this world? That's okay. Consuming X, Y, Z will allow you to do that. So how do you consume X, Y, and Z? You got to grind, baby. You got to work. And what do you get? It's, and when I say treats, I'm not just talking about fucking snacks and high fructose corn syrup and and uh, chicken nipplers and and uh, uh, extreme gobblers and and dipping crisp, crispers and kicking. That's one thing that I can't get over. How infantilizing the menus are at uh, chain family restaurants. Like, they want to humiliate you. They want you to know that you are at eating like an infant when they make you order a chicken dipper or a cluckin' crisper. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll have a chicken dipper, please. Like, how old are you? And they want you to know that. But anyway, it's not even about that. It's about, like, a, cop, a cop's authority. That's a treat. Getting to be treated like a big shot, no matter how much of an absolute lummox you are, that's a fucking treat. Racial, the racial uh, uh, wage is a treat. But uh, also, pornography, uh, uh, Ill, dr legal and illegal drugs, because it's all started part of the same market, those are treats. Sex is a treat. Because how do you get it? Money one way or the other if you're a man. Money one way or the other. And when the treats run out, all there is is the psychotic, hysterical, middle-class brain going confronted with a, a box that it cannot escape. Now, that the reason I say psychotic and, 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 and insane is because, of course, there is an opening. There is a trap door. There is a way out of the box of, oh, my God, the treats are running out. If I, I might have them all, but my kids won't. And if I cannot place myself in a continuum through time, I cannot make sense of secular life. Because even though I might have a formal religion, it has been secularized into this process. And so I am as connect I am as wedded to the idea of passing forward something as fucking uh the, the Mongol Kongs were, as ancient Romans were. Like, they need that. You, the idea, oh, it's all going to be gone when you leave. Yeah, but that means they're going to leave, and they don't want to leave. And the last the last thing that, because it's a constant bargaining with death as you get older. And, as, as, and if you've never confronted your own spirit and how your actions have affected other people, and you've allowed yourself to be moved like a marionette by the desires to avoid pain and gain pleasure through this, uh, the fucking Skinner box that we live in, if you've never confronted that, the prospect of death is terrifying, no matter how much you say you believe in heaven, because you don't really believe you'll go there. Even if you really say over and over again to your head, I am. So the thing that actually holds it together, beyond whatever very shallow patina 
of supernatural belief you have. What's really undergirding it is the same thing that undergirded pagan uh, Germanic chieftains, lineage, personal lineage, not humanity, personal lineage. Humanity, that is the religious, that is the uh, communist horizon that erupted in the mid-19th century as bourgeois subjectivity was emerging and was the antithesis of it and the thing that could, over time, confront it and overpower it. You realize I'm describing the historical dialectic in the exact same terms that the book of Revelation describes the war between heaven and hell because they're all the same narrative. And they all involve us creating an eternal abstraction. Either it is God's heaven in the... Uh, as the as medieval Christianity understood it, as a supernatural concept, or it is the planet motherfucking Earth. And the staying in the clouds, as it were, is associated with the reactionary trend in modern thought. The reaction to the emergence of liberal subjectivity that says, no, we're staying in the clouds. We're staying in a world where mystery suffuses our lives to the degree that we can think we're going to die and go to heaven and have that really power us through our lives without real question. And it is that desire to keep that that is the social base for reaction. Of course, the material base for reaction is accumulated wealth held by those in power saying, no, thank you, I don't want to lose it. Power holders within hierarchies saying, no, I want to keep my fucking hierarchy, because the abolition of that subjectivity is the abolition of their uh, right to rule, because the right to rule is fixed in a supernatural web of belief that transcends the visible. They want to keep it. So that's what reaction is. Then the socialist tradition, accepting the implication that this might very well be the only world that exists, then transfer that supernatural affiction to a notion of a personal self perpetuating eternally, which is always just going to be a fantasy of our mind in the moment, in our finite moment, just an extension of our finite mind into an infinity, which is, of course, impossible. So they cannot interact. They can't interlock. Instead, we have an idea of our... Uh, at a, at a base level, uh, we take the connection that, oh, I'm sorry. So what I mean to say is, so they, the people who want to stay in the, in, the, in the clouds, the reactionaries, they still have a material politics, and it is around extending their personal line, their lineage, their DNA, because they're operating from what are still basal, primitive human instincts. If we want to be, uh, uh, you know, if we want to be teleological about this, and we have to because we're talking about the way these things are conceived of, not whether or not they're true. That we do live in this teleology one way or another that moves us towards some perfected human. And those earlier forms extended uh, conceptually the human will through a line. But of course, once you recognize that that is in fact a merely a uh, social expression of a biological imperative that is actually not referring to your line specifically, but to an entire race, because your line cannot persist by itself. No matter what the pheromones are telling you, your line cannot persist by itself. It can only persist if the greater line of humanity persists. And it is that chain of logic and thought that transforms pre-capitalist uh, uh, honor, like kin honor culture, uh, to a recognition of universal human humanity. And if you do that, then your political horizon moves from extending individual liberty as far as possible, so that we can find out through the, the application of God's instrument, the market. Who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Who's not, who, who's going to be sorted through the giant machine of the market, which is where we're now going to see God's will, since we can no longer see it in the fucking... We can't see it in the sway of the trees. We fucking destroyed all the trees to put up a fucking bowling alley. 
we paved paradise to put up a parking lot. We also paved uh, our over our capacity to engage with the natural world in a way that allows us to re have reflected upon us the presence of a transcendent consciousness and a transcendent power. That's been abolished. Going back to it will destroy us. But that is what the insane middle class mind seeks to do, to retreat from the flame. But in doing that, it will only destroy itself. The way out of the box, of course, is an alliance with the working class to overthrow the capitalist class. And of course you could say, but that's impossible. It's not happening now. Correct. That's why it feels like we're in a doom spiral. Because that mindset was leavened during the popular front New Deal eras until the 70s by an infusion. I was talking about how like this middle class media structure is infused from outside by people from both classes. Well, over time, the landowning aristocratic class who used to write all of our best plays and whatnot, according to the Oxfordians anyway, uh, the men of leisure who sit in parlors and, and, and wrote richly, psychologically insightful uh, modern novels, the, 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 that population uh, shrank. They got rich, they fucked off, and they absorbed themselves into the bourgeois. They took their investments and became bourgeois over time. So that means they had less time for art. And so there were a few of them who were good at art. Meanwhile, though, the working class is getting much bigger. And as it is uh, being integrated into the upward mobility machine of American liberalism, it's bringing more and more people from the working class into uh, the culture machine and making it better and making it more insightful and rich and truthful and also more politically destabilizing to the system itself. Now, at the same time, there's another strain of ultra death-obsessed, leading-edge middle-class insanity that's also running like a black thread through the emergence of this popular culture. But again, you're talking about a small pool there. You're talking about people who are largely psychologically already kind of overclocked and cannot even deal with Keynesian liberalism at its apogee. Guys like Bob Welch, the insane man who owned a candy factory in, Ma in Massachusetts and became the founder of the John Birch Society. The guy had it made in Eisenhower's America, and he decided Eisenhower was a communist. Now, of course, he had what to himself were perfectly reasonable reasons, reasonable justifications for this, beyond all of his understanding of geopolitics, those mid-sized producers like uh, Welch, they weren't really favored by the uh, post-World War II uh, international project. You know, like the, the Marshall Plan and all that had a very obvious appeal to Wall Street, building up those markets in, in Europe again. But to American manufacturers who were going to have to face competition, that was uh, just more of the state's war against success. But Welch still did well. He could have just been like a Republican who muttered muttered into his, you know, into his morning newspaper. But he couldn't do that because something else was going on in his mind. Something personal. Something that I don't know. I've not read a biography of Welch. I'd be very interested to know about his childhood. But his brain in con combination in conflict with the world, a lot of dents and ridges got put in that in that thing. So that when he got in that position. After World War II, he says, no, I would rather destroy this entire thing. I would rather a nuclear apocalypse, some sort of act of will by God, an expression of God's existence, a form of judgment will be rained upon us if we cannot have freedom, which of course is not a thing that can be done, like the frontier vision of liberal subjectivity that these guys fixate on, the Jeffersonian ideal was superseded by the development of capitalism. So if you want capitalism, you have to surrender that subjectivity. But these guys were bought off from it and never really lost it. Because instead of being thrown into the cities to become uh, alienated uh, workers, they got to keep their little fucking factories and their little uh, uh, tinker toy houses in the countryside. And now that, that has... Dr that 
seed has now sprung to this poison flower of nihilistic politics because the conditions of those uh, middle class people in the in the heart of the of the American mind are going are are cracking up are cracking up under the change in material conditions that undergirds their their social order. And one expression of that is, okay, let's destroy this entire thing. Like the libertarian imagines, oh yes, we will destroy the, the, the um, yes, we might have a collapse of the economy, but it would very quickly be rebuilt by, by all of us untethered uh, geniuses. With, with, with the reins of government gone, we can start from scratch and very quickly rebuild an ideal society. I think that is like a libertarian fantasy. Uh, but if you're really in the, at the end stage, you don't even need that. You don't even need to believe that that will happen. Destruction is enough because it is an act. And that is, the, that is why the only energy in American politics right now is on the right. Because they know and have accepted that their organized conflict with the state will come to an apocalyptic conclusion. And they're okay with that. The reason the left has spent now and discombobulated and uh, uh, totally without political power is because the realization after the fail of Bernie hit that that was the case for left politics as well. If we're going to derail this, this uh, narconized uh, crazy train, the, the, this, this, sh this uh, uh, locomotive hospice filled with the dying brains of boomers who are raging politically while still pressing all the buttons that are keeping us strapped to a death chair, But they have on their side, the reason we're all still here is because they know, hey, if you want anything really different, like meaningfully different, like change the trajectory of our imagined human future, either for a line in the course of the right, who are sort of, 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 of fixed with, obsessed with birth rates, great replacement of the end of a race of people, which is just a closer uh, aesthetic representation of their narrower line-based politics, their libidinal politics. They're, it literally is just at the, at the, an orgasm through history. That is what they're trying to have. That is what the right uh, uh, allows for, because it, it consecrates as holy a regime of uh, domination. And for a while, you can justify that rationally, but over time, the rational falls away because it just doesn't exist. There is no rational reason for that to happen. If you organize people collectively and facilitate with technology their communication with one another, there will be reached a human concord. That, I think, is, yes, an, object, an article of faith, but I think a more reasonable article of faith to take from the experience of being a uh, alienated secular liberal subject. That's how I think of it. Is For me, that is the thing that flows from that experience without trying to second guess it. And if it requires a leap of faith, then that is where I can recognize, okay, this is where I actually have to believe in something. And what is it? And for me, it is a concept of God, yes, that gestures towards God's definition, which is the embodiment of all. Fundamental wholeness and unity. And so I say in my heart, you know, my politics would be, oh, yes, a left horizon. But the left horizon, since we now see that it cannot come from within politics, Bernie was the last attempt to do that in the post-political era. Can't, do, these, do these buttons still work? Like we had this rusted machine for working class political mobilization that was part of the Democratic Party, but then got gutted and left out in the field. And then the Sanders campaign is a bunch of post-apocalyptic uh, um, scavengers finding it in a field, putting it back together, using uh, the directions, which were like found in a drawer next door, next to it, uh, and putting it together and actually getting the pieces to work so it looks like the, the directions. It looks like the page. And then you press the buttons and none of them work. The, the lines are corroded. Now, that doesn't mean the left horizon is wrong, invalidated, not to be pursued. It does mean the left horizon 
will require more of us than participation, mostly passive, in electoral politics. And because that is a barrier that comfortable Americans, myself absolutely first and foremost included, don't want to cross because their own personal pleasure is too deeply wedded to their notion of the good and the right and the correct world. And so that means that the left is paralyzed. Not anyone's fault. Like I said, I'm, I'm part of this. It is a general phenomenon. It will be punctured, but only by changes in conditions, individually and then collectively over time. And so now, though, the energy is on the right, where passive participation in politics, you believe, can actually get you what you want. Like, these guys genuinely believe, of course, it's all contradictory, and it's all self negating but that's the nature of the bourgeois mind, because it's schizophrenic. It has anti-logic. And that's why you cannot defeat these people through reason. You cannot convince them otherwise. Because... It doesn't matter. It's all being libidinally driven by the desire to annihilate oneself, the death drive, to die without having to humble oneself in any way. Now, they might all think, oh, the elections are rigged. I don't even bother voting. And some of them have stopped voting, which is very funny. Uh, but they also do vaguely understand that if they keep voting for Republicans or supporting MAGA, whatever that means, that something is going to give, fundamentally. And they have their own fantasy of what that's going to look like. They have their own Book of Revelation all written out. It's the, it's the fucking, uh, it's the Q day. It's the day of the rope. And now, they might not get it electorally. In fact, I'd say they can't get it electorally, because again, electoral politics cannot produce a existential conflict within capitalism, because the machine exists not to bring about political conflicts, but to diffuse political conflicts. So it can't do it. It cannot come to that point of rupture from within. But if enough spokes get thrown in the wheel, from without, you could see the emergence of something significant around the money and political and social infrastructure that emanates from this aggrieved middle class. Now, like... For example, in uh, in Spain, thinking about Spain a lot since I'm finishing up writing the uh, four-part Spanish Civil War series that's going to be debuting next month. I will be off of the air, but you will be hearing these, I believe. Hopefully we're going to organize it so that it works that way. Um, the middle class, who the, the, the moneyed middle class who voted for the CETA, the Catholic Populist Party, that was the main right-wing party in pre-war Spain. Uh, they believe by voting for Seda, they would uh, abolish this existential conflict with the left, uh, which is how the right will always see the liberals' state and the left together. The liberals believe that they can separate those things because they separate those things, because they're closer to the left culturally and psychologically. But their positions are completely different, and their material interests will always overrun any of their sensitivities. So they will always end up siding with reactionary capital un at its most unfettered over a real existential threat to property relations that they depend on. And that is what, honestly, the communists didn't understand, I don't think. You see over and over again, and it's from necessity, this attempt before World War I, for Stalin, and then the Comintern, and then the Western Populist Front Communist parties to make a deal with the capitalists. Because, hey, you see the, the fascists as a threat too. But they just did not see those two threats symmetrically. The threat of fascism was, oh my God, am I going to have to salute that bloody Hitler every morning when I get up, when I turn on the radio? Oh, oh. I mean, and it might extend to like deeper worries, but the, there's no fear that like the fundamental bourgeois social relation will be abolished because the fascists don't have an alternative to it. They don't even gesture towards one. It is just the thing we have eternally and at the expense of the other.
Now, the SEDA did not get what they wanted, or the SEDA voters didn't get what they wanted, but what they did get was a military coup, an attempted coup that was fought back at first by the left, but then won by the right. They got what they wanted. They got eternal liberal subjectivity. And of course, now, the uh, reactionary Catholics who actually fought for Franco, the, the, the phalangist youth, and especially the Carlists who formed the backbone of the, of the army in uh, Spain, like the true believers, at first, like before they started conscripting people, the nationalist force was true believers in the form of Carlists and phalangists, more Carlists and phalangists, because the phalange was uh, middle class sons. They were the, the children of professionals. A lot of them were students or their dads were landowners. And when the war happened, they all signed up for the flange if, uh, if they hadn't already. And many of them, and most of them opted, though, instead of going to the front to fight, they opted to stay in the villages and towns and make uh, have sco settle scores with every worker who ever looked at them funny, any waiter that ever gave them guff, and just line, up, line them up against the cemetery fence and shoot them. Oh, uh, fight on the front? No, thank you. Check, please. Because they were, they were the senoritos. The Carlists were made up of these small-holding peasants in northeastern Spain uh, the, from Navarre. They were like Basques who were really Basque nationalists because they didn't have any complaints, really. They were, they, they were able to prosperously live on farms where there was enough land for them and their family to farm. They didn't have to hire workers, and they didn't have to hire themselves out, which means they opted out of capitalist alienated social relations. So, of course, they thought eternal Spain, that's the thing. And we got to fight for it because these guys want to end it. But they ended, the side they fought for, and, and, and the, the Requetes volunteered in huge numbers to go fight in the fucking uh, front. They didn't want to hang out in the rear. They, it wouldn't have been manly to do that. They wanted to go and fight the enemy. Viva Cristo Rey was their call. Because they were bumpkins. They were hillbillies. They were the sons of the soil. You know, morons. <laughs> And I don't mean that like that they were existentially stupid. I mean, they their lives were of what Marx called rural idiocy. And they were they were the backbone of that army, other than the ones that just got paid. Other than one of the ex-criminals and uh, defeated Moroccan rebels who were like, well, if I can't defeat the fucking Spanish, I'll at least get a paycheck from them. And I get to go to Spain and shoot these motherfuckers who invaded my country. But they didn't get anything they want. The Carlos got squeezed out. They got merged with the Falange, the, the single legal political party. They got to keep the Red Berets, though. And anything that they were saying about, like, a cooperative economy that, like, modeled feudal, re feudal social requirements, bilateral, not just, do not just uh, rights, but duties to one another, gone. And then where is Spain now? It is a godless place. It was the first place in Europe to legalize gay marriage. The state that the Requete saved. Because... Franco managed them to capitalism. He managed. He used. He, he kept a gun to the head of the peasants while they raised uh, agricultural. Uh, they intensified agricultural uh, investment, but kept a gun to the head of the peasants to keep lab wages down and therefore consumption down and prevent the kind of hyperinflation you get if you try to do that without seizing the means of production. They built a tourist industry. Half the people on the, co the Costa del fucking soul are just red-faced, horrific fucking Brits. Uh, if anyone's seen Sexy Beast, fucking Ray Winstone. And, they, and they, even though, you know, they were, uh, they were a medieval country in the 19th century, by the mid-20th century, they were, you know, a, a, a relative to Northern Europe, underdeveloped, but relative to, like, the Eastern Europe, well-developed country. And what happened? They turned into comfortable bourgeois no matter what their jobs were, in culture, and then boom, God died, and they fucking brought in gay marriage. Uh, the king didn't want to continue the, tr the tradition that uh, Franco tried to enforce on him because the social conditions had changed, because they had been defeated by victory. You know, the whole stupid hard times make strong men duh, thing. That is that, that thing is not necessarily wrong. It's merely a dense and uh, 
pointless description of a historical dynamic that is powered by class conflict. And if you take that part out of it, it's meaningless. It's just a way to pose and just desire strong men, which really desires, what you're really desiring is that apocalyptic intervention that will redeem the apocalypse by revealing who deserves to survive. And it, they believe they will survive that contest. And the left doesn't because they are materially uh, more vulnerable. And I don't, and, and some of them might have uh, jobs that pay them well, but do they know how to fucking survive absent capitalist social relationships? Do they have the know-how and the social networks to survive in a place where capitalist social relationships are severed? No. Now, I must stress, the right doesn't have these either. But this is what's important. They think they do. They think that their guns and their self-regard are enough for them to survive that situation. But the reality is they absolutely would not. I mean, some of them would individually, but they would not be able to persist as free people the way they imagine themselves. They would be subsumed into some governing structure if human social organism, if the human social organism continued, which it would. They would not get to be eternal uh, uh, Jeffersonian frontiersmen. They would not get to live a, uh, a cyberpunk version of the Western bow male masculine ideal. They wouldn't get to be the man with no name. They'd die or they would end up being subsumed into some successor statelet or more likely become an employee of some self-sufficient corporate techno enterprise that is able to put a, a footprint down big enough to create a circulatory network of commodities and, and you can join them and work on their terms. All, all, all the fucking Clint Eastwoods are going to get killed or they're going to get combined because that dream is a fantasy. That fantasy could persist in the frontier because it was because not because you were not a lone person out there on the countryside. That's just it. That thing never existed. Those frontier uh, uh, autonomous frontier Jeffersonian yeomen, they were only able to live because they were uh, embedded in a social network, a capitalist social relationship of state subsidized railroads, state subsidized military security that allowed them to have their little log cabins and to bust their sod. And if that goes away, no one could fucking uh, sustain themselves. Sure, hell, not people who are 200 years removed from anything like that relationship to their environment. But they think they'll make it, and so their politics have energy. Because they're willing to vote even though the possibility comes, the, that vote might end things. They're okay with taking that responsibility. That is the distinction. What if, if you vote like that, uh, the Constitution will be superseded. There'll be no more Constitution. Okay. If you vote like that, the economy will collapse. Okay. If you vote like that, uh, everything will fall apart. Okay. Good. Now, again, that is how you sh that's the attitude that you should have politically to questions of survival, and which is that's what we're facing. We can't fa uh, ex we can only accept it personally. We can't really generate it culturally, but that is the situation we find ourselves in. Will we not survive or, or die necessarily? Because we can't choose that, no matter what we think. Live by our own lights or die an instrument. Die having surrendered our humanity and therefore having to deal with that in our final moments. Have to reckon with our severance from one another. To be damned, in other words. Or do we act and in acting find purpose, meaning, and redemption? Now, of course, the actions that the right-wing people are taking are fantasy cosplay just as much as voting for Democrats is. But because both the left and right will tell you through their cultural speakers that the right is a threat to democracy, with the right thinking that's a good thing because of how they imagine democracy versus what they think the media means by that, 
and the left, who the liberalism, because the liberals and left speak the same language. They have the same understanding of what democracy means. So when they say it's a threat to democracy, it hits the left different than it does the right. When I say the right and left, I just mean people with different consumption patterns. The way you talk about uh, people who liked uh, ER or Chicago Hope. Just the people who press one of the two buttons. And it's that it's those groups of people pushing those buttons that powers the political machine like a water wheel. And the liberals and the left both are held hostage by the right because when they vote, they cannot, in good conscience, vote in a way that they think will end things like democracy and the economy. And so, and that's why all discussion of third party votes and we should, whether you should vote for Cornell West or fucking the People's Party, any of this bullshit is meaningless. It will never amount to anything because the number of people who will say, I'm on the left and I am willing to vote in a way that does this because I don't think it would be my fault. And then they're having a whole convoluted understanding of why it's not your fault or how, and, and, and believing more importantly that that would make you feel better if it happened. That's always going to be a small fragment of people. Cranks, basically, myself, again, included. Political, political addicts, junkies. For the political process, political spectacle, political subjectivity, people who are addicted to being right about things. They're annoying and they're incredibly loud on the internet and in media in general because of their motivation, but they are not numerous. So they're always going to be splitting their vote between a handful of cranks because only cranks would do that in good conscience. That's the thing about Bernie. People want to say, oh, Bernie's a sellout. Billy was trying to Bernie was trying to sheep dip people into the Democratic coalition. No, he's a guy who has because he sprouted out of the liberal tradition like all of the modern left did. There's no other place for it to come from, so it's stupid to even point that out. He absorbed those ideas of of of, of what democracy is. It is a species wide progress towards a goal of social harmony, not an individual battle of blood to see who uh, rules and who uh, is to be dominated. He shares that horizon with the, the left. Now, of course, liberalism give, projects that, but that's only through one of its Janus faces. It also protect, projects a vision of redemption to conservatives. The problem is more and more conservatives don't believe it anymore. More and more conservatives are alienated from it because of the general, I hate to use the word, but wokening social liberalization of media and of culture that was inevitable once the social revolution went out the way it did in the 60s, where the, there was a treaty where control of uh, resources would stay in the hands of owners, hierarchy would not be touched, but social reins would be handed over to liberals. And so now social messages are alienating to the right in a way they used to be alienating to the left. So now they have complete control of the process because they will push the button. They do not bluff. If enough of these people get elected to Congress, the next time there's a debt ceiling thing, they will default. I am pretty convinced of that. And now, of course, the Institutional Republican Party has ways to prevent that from happening. And look at what happened with Marjorie Taylor Greene. It shows you that it wouldn't just be getting these people in office. It would be getting enough of these people in office that the true believers would just by sheer volume push out the opportunists. Because at first, it is going to be, the, the zone is going to be flooded with a hardcore number of real true believing cranks and then a huge number of opportunists. And they will never press the button. They will never do the thing that, unle un that unleashes hell. And a lot of people, of course, go in there on both sides as true believers who get turned into opportunists because the, they're, they realize once they're in power the distance from their apocalypse that they actually are. I think that's, and of course, part of that is just, oh yeah, because they're, they're materially comfortable. Yes, exactly. We cannot disentangle these things. Our understanding of the urgency of the crisis is directly proportional to our personal comfort. We can have an intellectual understanding of the crisis, but our lives will not provide us with the friction necessary to build an active relationship to the crisis.
And again, they might be right. A, a technological messiah has emerged every single time this this crisis, the, this Malthusian uh, mind has, 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 the Malthusian eye has opened. But I think what they have underestimated is the possibility that, yes, the thing that they're, the, the, the subjectivity they're trying to extend eternally could survive, but in a form that they would find unrecognizable and monstrous. And the thing is, they don't, they still don't have as their first goal annihilation. That's what's powering it. That's the engine. But right, but their first goal is well, we need to actually be fighting. We need to find a conflict where we can we can act as a state and as citizens against our enemy. And that is what liberalism doesn't allow for. Because liberalism creates a process that diffuses crises, and because of treats and because of the infusion of profits that's usually enough but over time it becomes insufficient and so they want action they need war now that means either war with an outside enemy or war with an internal enemy the war with the outside enemy, even though we have a war in Ukraine and we have this war with Russia that we can uh, we can pour ourselves into, that's been lib-coded. Because again, we need a fantasy of action for both sides. And of course, because the libs are so, more, so much more dainty and so much more polite and so much less savage than the insane right-wingers, even though they're suffering from the exact same, uh, the exact same bourgeois hysteria and psychosis, their war is way off there. Their war is uh, among white people and against a country that uh, helped bad Republicans. The right doesn't want anything that stepped on. It needs something harder, like a war with real enemies, foreign invaders. Because this is somebody who threatens my seed. This is somebody who threatens my line. And so that means we got to be shooting, we got to have our guys shooting their guys. And yes, Mexico is the vent before you get to the final point, which they're, they're dying for, but they will never do of their own because, again, they're passive subjects. They will let everything be done to them. They will never act on their own. Yes, some of them will go do a Super Bowl riot after their guy loses and walk around like dopes at the Capitol building. But they will not seize real power. They don't have the people in the positions to do so. Because those physicians, any any chair with a butt in it that matters is by the experience of being in that chair metaphysically wedded to the system. Metaphysically wedded to the system. The only people who are getting there are people who... Now, they might go in as hardcore true believers, pu push the button. But, oh my God, the upward massaging experience of being listened to, getting power over others, the fantasy of control over the system that you're now part of, it makes you believe, you know what, maybe the worst uh, uh, apocalyptic fantasies of like ne uh, total mongrelization of races and uh, gunpoint trans transitioning for everybody, maybe that won't happen. Maybe we don't need to have that war. And why do I think that? Because I get to go to Lum Diplomat every week. Why would I be that worried? As opposed to people who might have a lot of money, but they also probably have a lot of debt, and they live next to people who every day are fucking dropping dead from things like fentanyl. Like, that really is still happening in a big chunk of this country. And it's not... The people who are politically motivated to the right are not the people suffering from that. They're the people who live near it. They're the people who experience it vicariously through social relationships, those that they have. It's more vital to them. And so their response must it has to have that vitality. Going to war with Mexico. Now, I don't necessarily think that that's going to happen absent some big disruptive cataclysm, which is, of course, the flip side of the imagined uh, uh, redeeming uh, uh, second coming of technology that liberalism uh, fantasizes about. They're all mirrors of each other. It's one 
uh, eschatological death drive. It's it's it is one social wide DMT trip to oblivion, and everybody is just cast in different parts on different sides of the pyramid. But all of their actions are twisting, are, are, are ritually reaffirming the emergence of this black obsidian consciousness that is pure technological extraction. And I don't even like calling it AI because that implies that it's intelligent. Artificial intelligence implies that it has some imbued, like a soul, essentially. I think that's what that, to me, that's what artificial intelligence means. A soul, in that it is an imponderable depth that generates thought. It is a depth that is, it is thought that is powered by an ab that absence I was talking about that can be filled by human uh, human connection and can be deepened by alienated social action. But either way is the thing that generates all consciousness. And uh, that will never happen under capitalism because what capitalism is is a god that is made up of, like all gods are, reflections of the human values that worship it. And the way they worship it, the way we worship our God means that we are building a machine with a hole in its center. And that hole, that vacuum can only be filled by one very simple algorithm. And it is surplus extraction. It's the thing that's deeper than any human contribution to the economy. It's the thing that, it's the lightning bolt that pushes us through life. It's the electric, it's the electrification of our muscles. So it will be a dead machine. It will be a dead machine. I just got to ask, answer a text here. And it will just pump the earth dry, and then it will eventually shudder to a halt. And there will probably be people in there to the end, husks, that will go out the same way. But guess what? Change is the only constant. Life continues, finds a way. And you might say, oh, big deal. That's So what? But... That is just as abstract as the thought of any horizon of human evolution. The, 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 thing, the, the fantasy, the bourgeois fantasy of left liberation is that, oh no, I get to participate in this at every point. I get to participate as an activated member in this process all along the way. And it's like, well, you can do that if you commit yourself to it and probably get destroyed by it. You can make that the axis of your uh, uh, your life energies. And it would be a good thing to do. And I think more people should do it. I wish I could, but I can't. I don't, I don't, that's why I don't judge anybody for anything they do at that point or what or don't do because I have no position to judge anyone. But the thing firing you through that life, like it's not going to care if you get bourgeois comfort. It's not going to care if you still are able to do uh, self-care routines it's not going to care about deeply embedded ideas that undergird your own notion of the right and the good that have been built by a life living in a fucking American. But if you don't do that, then you have to accept, oh, uh, this is a political horizon that is, if I'm honest with myself, uh, suicidal. And, and that there is, no, there is no way that I can trick myself into thinking that just by being a regular citizen, this machine is going to move. This is going to avoid catastrophe. And I think that it is the neurotic need to be passively political and still think that that drives so much stasis and misery. And, and pathological behavior among people who consider themselves leftist. 
because it's that knowledge that, oh, this isn't going to do it, but that lack of will to do anything else that drives you towards uh, uh, doomerism and self-loathing and self, uh, self-punishment, self psychological and physical. But if you accept, oh, okay, the catastrophe is going to happen, but that doesn't impact the greater sweep of the human experience that I am enmeshed in and believe in and believe has all value and that we all are part of and should be committed to. And if that, if you accept that, then you can act politically not out of a desire to punish oneself or uh, feel big and uh, find uh, an outlet for uh, undigested venom, somebody else to yell at that you can feel like is doing good. The, the, the spleen that is always there in political action, like all action carried out under capitalism, uh, it can be vented if th that uh, that need to to personally involve oneself or one's immediate line in a uh, conceivable break with capitalism as we live with under it. Only by doing that can you then act in good faith about it. Okay, if I accept that premise, now what? But you have to accept the premise first. Okay. I hope that made sense. I say as I literally am trying to distract myself from, uh, you know, the, the fear I have that I uh, far exceeded my ability to uh, avoid catastrophe in my own life. But again, uh, that's neuroses, and it's countered by faith uh, in others. It's the only thing that can ground you. But yeah, the one thing I want to emphasize is just like, there is a very, very good reason that all of the uh, political energy both in terms of like realizable horizons. I mean, you've got the entire liberal establishment out there saying that if Trump wins, it will be the end of American democracy. That is a heady brew to have your enemies saying that. And more importantly, to really believe it. Because of course, the right says the same thing about the liberals and the left, but of course, none of them believe it, which is why they're so fucking miserable. They believe that the, the, worst, the worst story of the, the left is the same thing as their story. So not only do they have a, like a realizable horizon, they also feel unfettered by cultural demands. They they feel like they have transcended the fake morality of liberalism. And it is a fake morality. That's the thing. They've replaced it with a funhouse mirror of it that just uh, replaces the polarity but maintains the sadism. But they can correctly point to, to liberal morality as a fraud and then and then feel transgressive for violating it. But all they're doing is putting a different mask on the same regime of repression. They've just switched the pluralities of sadism because it's undergirded by sadism. And of course, also masochism. It's the punishment of the self, a pleasurable punishment of the self and others. People who watch hours and hours of television just to get mad. The pleasurable punishment of the self. So now, yeah, there is a there is a right wing avant garde, but it's just masking a general drift towards annihilation that's embedded in the liberal state. Because only class conflict, only class war, only class arraignment can break free, break out of the psychological prison of the bourgeois mind. Because it's that open door, it's that untaken road that sweeps away all of the locked 
polarities that can't be moved. Because the bourgeois subject is on one side or the other of this thing while containing both. And it cannot imagine resolving any of these crises because it accepts as, irre as unmovable all negations. Everything is negated within itself without any understanding that if all is negated, there is a residual positive expression of those negations. But that expression, that positive expression, can only be turned into a new dynamic, a new positive dynamic, a new dynamic that builds towards, instead of decays away from, is with the introduction of a new subjectivity and a new consciousness, those of the, that of the exploited worker, through the lens of exploitation as experience. Now, we lost that after the, when the neoliberal era began, but it is being reintroduced from the grassroots through the expanding technologies on offer. And it is an intersection between these new grassroots subjectivity emerging and the continuing social and political life we find ourselves in, where we have these structures, this machine, remember, that we rebuilt that can't work, that can't run because it's made up of these self-negating concepts. The only way to, to bring in the energy to fuel this thing is from outside of it. And that's why the, another reason that the right-wing horizon is energized, because even if they believe that, they would say no, because the sort of, because uh, the resolution of this antagonism that you're proposing would also abolish my subjectivity, and I don't want that. I would rather reify my subjectivity through nihilistic destruction of it. Suicide, revolutionary as it were, suicide. Now, of course, none of them actually think that because they're fat suburban babies and they don't think that would happen. But that's all part of their greater right of delusion. They have no idea what could happen with the things they do. They have no idea how at this stage, this clattering, wheezing machine that is set against itself at every level and is seeing springs and fucking uh, gears fly off like in a cartoon, how it's going to respond to these new pressures on it. What kind of tumors are going to spring up? Yeah, we got to build a new machine. But yeah, the right can say, okay, uh, no, we'd rather not. Because they have a Trump for that. They have a final thing. And, and so we all have to ask ourselves, is that good enough? Is that enough to get you out of bed? The thought of being sadistic to some group of people that you can ontologically lay blame for this systemic phenomenon. And the scary thing is, the answer is, for most middle-class subjects, is going to be, yes, I can. I, I will take that. As long as I can coat it with some treaty, treat, treats, I will coat it. I will, I will do it. Some, some promise that something good is going to come out of the vending machine. And that's what we all are charged to resist, even at the cost of being uncomfortable and then having to do something with that discomfort, having to alchemize that discomfort into something productive. And that's how I can justify myself sitting here and doing this, because yes, I say I'm distracting myself, but I'm also generating something, an understanding of the world that gives me a greater sense of poise and ease within it and a greater clarity of action moving forward then that might be of use to other people who are hearing it that is again justification is it self-interested of course but i have to take that frozen conflict that i personally cannot resolve have the faith that others are reflecting the world accurately to me. That's it. That's where the faith comes in. It's a faith in others. 
And the way we can do that is if we accept that even if we are uh, abused in our faith, that we cannot be uh, uh, disabused of it by letting go of the need to have every interaction have be positive sum in our like just ex vault of experience. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's it for today. I think I made sense of some things to myself. I ended up at the same place, though, of course, as I always do. Because, of course, why wouldn't I? I didn't go anywhere. I'm still here. So, obviously, everything should come back to where you started. At least then you know where you are, as opposed to fantasizing that if you're on a journey that will lead you somewhere that's going to be materially different than where you are now. That'll come on its own time and uh, in ways that you'll never be able to predict. It all, it all just comes from the fact that feeling like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It's like one of the best feelings in the world to me. And, and it clearly is for others, too, because, you know, there is this drive. I mean, there was something to Rousseau's uh, idea of self-directed learning. Because after a while, once the reality of, like, human frailty and subjectivity, the finitude of the human experience becomes, uh, like, really apparent the need to uh, secure oneself against that uh, also increases. The problem, though, for the education of children, though, is that for a lot of kids, that sense of anxiety and uh, discomfort, it doesn't come for a long time. And uh, so it'll be a while before you get kind of brought back to learning. Uh, there has to be somebody to direct it, you know, to, to direct the flow of energy. Uh, because you can't rely only on the most uh, neurotic freaks to, like, pay attention, which is essentially what we have now. Like, we think it's intellect, and, like, the right wing likes to think that they are doing race and IQ shit, and what they're, and that, that IQ measures uh, intelligence. IQ measures neuroses. IQ measures uh, your delusional relationship to, um, to figures of authority in your life. Because... Yes, IQ does show how good you'll do on tests. It actually does. This is the thing people say, IQ doesn't judge anything. It, it really will. You look at IQ tests, they do show you how well people will perform at taking tests. It does that. And you might say, well, that's not that doesn't mean anything. In a meritocracy where test res results get you into jobs and stuff and into, in, into uh, educational opportunities, it absolutely does. Because native intelligence has to, at a certain point, be shaped by experience with the world it has to be directed uh in ways energy has to be like positively linked to like effort has to be linked to a positive response like i'm learning more and making more sense of the world by doing this i'm getting more accolades from other people by doing this i'm increasing the chances that i can have a stimulating and rewarding job for doing this it puts all this energy in these directions but it's based on a neurotic relationship to these authority figures, not an eternal ability of the mind. And so when people say we need to like, we need, okay, we're in, we are in crisis. The earth can no longer support the number of people who are on it. How do we choose who will survive? Well, we got this list of the most neurotic freaks on earth. The most power fixated weirdos in the world, even though we built up this insane technical capacity that could be directed towards a sustainable existence for billions of people on this planet. We have to destroy everything because we are, all of us, gripped by a middle-class, neurotic, authoritarian, sadomasochistic identity that is wrapped around achievement and uh, all these concepts. And it does a great job of powering a machine and it did a great job of piling up a bunch of wealth, but it can no longer, the same way that every previous regime of power that's ever been built 
It can no longer sustain itself in a crisis of its own creation. Every single regime of authority that has ever existed, no matter what its ideological and spiritual uh, uh, foundations were, collapses once the environment around it changes and it cannot change its own internal structure and remove its own hierarchies, which it needs to do to be more efficient in its distribution of energy. So yes, this meritocracy, the IQ meritocracy, built the world, and now it is destroying it. And these people's answer is, let's destroy everything and rebuild just with the crazy people. Just with the most neurotic freaks. Just with the most stamped with a th the authoritarian boot of all humans. Because they took their intelligence, which yes, there is a relationship between being crazy and being intelligent in other ways. Being perceptive, I would say, in other ways. Because that insanity emerges from the unresolvable contradiction between being and non-being. I am alive, but will not be. That cannot be processed by a conscious mind. If you are aware of it, and certain brains become aware of it early, it drives you insane. What IQ does is measures the kids who, when driven insane by that idea, get strapped into a fucking hamster cage, get strapped to a, uh, get, get put into a rat maze, get put into a Skinner box where achievement and uh, in, in, in abstract thought, in certain forms of abstract thought are rewarded materially, spiritually, intellectually. Uh, 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 all, all, of, all the things that make you up get rewarded by it. And then zoom, you're good. But eventually you get to a point where, oh, everybody in charge now is addicted to forms of, of validation that can only exist under the system that can no longer exist. But again, we're not even saying, oh, yes, but smart people are neurotic. No, no, no. Smart people in a situation where structures ex exist to catch that neuroses and channel it positively. Oh, hey, you can do X, Y, and Z. Well, here's a gold star. Here's a trip to the science fair. Here's X, Y, and Z. Here's the prospect of college career. If you have those latter, you can bank that energy. If you don't, you will lose it. It will be diffused. It'll be burned up by feudal in individual uh, rebellion. So this is the funniest thing to me about the uh, the new intellectual right guys, is that they think they want to rever revert to the pre-capitalist forms of nobility. They want a new noble caste, and they want to have that mo noble caste emerge out of a bunch of fucking scribes, a bunch of eunuchs, a bunch of people who learned the opposite of all the, the lessons that a warrior would learn during the same period that they learned to assert themselves in the world. Not by sitting in a fucking room, not by looking at a bunch of little symbols, but by running and jumping and riding on a fucking horse and wielding a fucking sword and risking one's life and winning victory. That, like, uncluttered, unneurotic mind, the savage simplicity of a steppe barbarian, it has been bred out of everyone, including, and not just including, especially and most of all these motherfuckers. In fact, the people they want to exterminate are the only people who are holding any of those values alive because they're the only ones who might have to fucking fight for their lives when they're kids. They want to delude themselves into thinking that market competition is the same thing, but it is not. It is a uh, qualitatively different experience that creates qualitatively different human subjectivity. If it doesn't, then there is no change through history. Because you can say all day there's never an abrupt break, but what there is, is there is a process that has fulcrums, that has inflection points, and has punctuated equilibriums. I know punctuated equilibrium has been disproven, the G Stephen Jay Gould thing, but if you're looking at the level of culture and consciousness, you have 
one mindset that is always changing but is stabilized around certain ideas and certain values. You have disruption that accelerates the change. And remember, it's always being fueled by class conflict beyond anything. Even if everything else is stable, class conflict continues over time. Everybody gets older and dies, so entropy in the system is continuous regardless of the stability of the relationship to the environment. And then there is a acceleration of change and then inflection point, explosion of difference violently. An explosion of energy vast usually resolves in mass numbers of dead. And then at the other end of it, new people with new understandings of the world that reverse the polarities and change the way we understand things. And the instinctive servility to uh, ideas, to abstract symbols that the IQ class has cannot create a culture. It's sterile by itself. As part of a dynamic with others, it can build something. But as the lone locus point of a totally technologicized, dehumanized world, it's no more productive than AI is. In the 19th, I'll end with this. In the late 19th century, uh, there was, as is always the case in America, a hysteria in the middle classes. This hysteria was about the future of uh, culture, American culture, which they defined, of course, as white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, middle-class culture, the merchant class of the emerging post-war republic. And they were worried that, they, that their culture was being beset on all sides by savages, uh, the heathen Chinese out, out west, and uh, way more importantly to the urban ones, though, in the east, uh, the former slaves uh, and uh, the Irish Catholic and Italian Catholic rabble coming out on the boats. Oh, and also the uh, seething mass of hillbillies who had recently brought the country to disunion. All these people uh, considered threats to uh, American culture and society. And now when we look back at that period, all of the culture produced by those people who are protecting America, all the culture produced by middle-class wasps is completely forgotten. It is in the dustbin of history. And that's not because of some fucking uh, uh, Jewish conspiracy. It's because it was boring and it was flat and it was, it was not truthful. All the culture that survived that time came from that very groups that all these guys were freaking out about. And that center is always a vacuum. And it's okay if things are revolving around the vacuum and maybe even moving towards the vacuum, but they have to be in, con in com uh, some sort of dialectic with other forms of life, other social realities, other subjectivities. If it is the only thing, then it is a vacuum and it is death for humanity. And that's what these dipshits think that they're fucking trying to unleash on the world. And so that's why even though there is at least the advantage of, hey, you know, uh, this way I can feel good about all the stuff the government's going to be doing in the next 30 years to other people. And I can and I can vicariously cheer it on and I can uh, let my sadistic hatred of others who are just a reflection of my own failings uh, discharge my enemy and my sense of uh, anxiety. Uh, but, you know, it's at the cost of a deeper reckoning with truth. And it is at the cost of forsaking the very concept of love. Because once you start severing the human connection to the possibility of the concept of love, then you sever it from every other person. Because there is no stable justification that uh, undermines and relieves you of the necessary vulnerability that comes with loving somebody else. And that's why they fixate on things like nation and culture and race because they think these are real bonds. These are true things that uh, will protect us. They are absolutely, they're quicksand. They're, they're made, they're, they're, they're phantoms as much as anything else. They're spooks. And what will reveal them as that is crisis, which will continue. So all your little fantasies about racial solidarity of the white people or whatever the fuck or Western civilization are all going to go away 
And you're going to have to, at every point, either be destroyed by that uh, process or uh, justify it and rationalize it to yourself. Because art is truth, and middle-class subjectivity is a lie. And we're addicted to art because it's often the only place we can see truth in our lives. But that required that outside force feeding into it. The working class pumping life into the organs of the culture. And that that has largely been sealed, and all we're left with is people fuck is 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 uh is people suffocating in their car a culture of people just carbon monoxide poisoning them running their car in the garage and watching their lies reflected to them because money because the art in truth or the truth in art is leavened by the amount of money in it in the production of it that's that's the important thing and the consumption of it and mass media can be consumed by everyone, which means that the sensitivity, our sensitivity to truth can really like tease out like profound things, but it requires a great deal of money to produce it, which narrows the aperture of the kind of truths that can be revealed and expressed. And we get addicted to those expressions of truth in our childhood, but now they are evaporating. And I think the misery of the younger people a lot of it, yes, it's the internet and it's the destruction of attention, but it's also the lo lo the loss of the experience of coming into contact with like a truthful and sublime object. And the right loves to talk about this, how, oh, everything's ugly now. But it's because we are all doing the bidding of capitalism. It's not because any group of bad people took over with bad aesthetics. These are the aesthetics of a culture that cannot tell the truth to itself about anything. And, and the right-wing, uh, uh, backward-looking response to this is just another flavor of that. It's another stream of discontented and commodified and recirculated and sublimated alienation to the system. So that's why all, all the aesthetic right-wingers can fuck off, because it's a, just another form of bourgeois liberal indulgence. And it is honestly grotesque to watch. And I know I'm just doing a different version of bourgeois indulgence, but here's the thing. It feels true to me, and I trust others that others, I trust that others exist, that others have independent minds and independent consciousnesses, that they're animated by a similar sense of what is good and right, that I recognize in them and see reflected. And, and I just go from there, just a chain of, of people to, to the ground. And that's all any of us can do. And that is why prescribing action is so futile, because only the people who you're really connected to can tell you what's really going on and what matters. That's the important thing. What matters? What, what should be prioritized? Priority is the most important thing about any question, because it decides what you do about it. But priority is the very thing that is completely flattened out of media expressions of what's going on. That's the, that is the thing that uh, is systematically eliminated, not by a mind, not by them, not by the WEF or, or, uh, or the Koch brothers, but by the fact that, uh, that determining, um, um, Determining priority, determining how uh, important something is to your life, uh, is a personal decision. It, it, it depends on personal circumstances. There's a, there's a Category 15 hurricane that's going to hit Florida pretty soon. I know about that story, but only people, but only people in Florida, for only people in Florida can ter can ma make that like a priority. But the news can't just be made up of those things because then. Most people are never going to be implicated in something, and, and their in interest is going to wane. To keep them engaged with the news, hey, 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 
Hey, yeah, I know. Yes, I know you don't live there, but hey, 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 I know. Yeah, there was a murder. I know it wasn't by you. Hey, hey, hey. Then you have to have subjects that are not particular, that have, that for which no one really has to do anything. Like, has to in their life. And those become the only things we talk about. And those become the focuses of all of our passions. And then we find things to do about them to act out our uh, fantasy relationship to politics. I was being hyperbolic. It's like a category, it's like a, the strongest hurricane that has ever existed. It's as strong as can be humanly possible. I gotta say, this is interesting to see if that changes. If like the, the theoretical bounds of a hurricane actually move. Or if it like sticks there. That has significant implications for a lot of things. So yeah, we all have to find in our hearts what we need to do. And then just do it. And know that it's not going to change anything for the future. It's not going to right the ship. It's not going to prevent anything from bad from happening. Uh, it is just going to communicate faith and love to other people in the moments that we have. That sounds incredibly lame, but that's all I'm left with. Someone says Terrence McKenna. Yeah, it's interesting with McKenna. He could not believe in the class war. He could not believe in class consciousness and, and, and class as and, and class antagonism antagonism is the engine of history because he had faith in the liberal techno uh, horizon he could you can't blame him for it why wouldn't he he was at the apogee of it he was at the point where the fucking eye opened and it appeared as though all possible horizons for human limitation were going to be technologically surmounted why do you need class war why do you need any war? Why do you need hierarchy? Why do you need all these fucking forms to fill out? Why do you need all this bureaucracy? Oh, it's not going to hit the U.S. Okay, so it's just going to absolutely annihilate a bunch of islands? God, I hope it doesn't hit Cuba. Fuck, man. And the thing is, technology, it is our doomer. It is going to kill us, but it's also... Anything that saves us, and that's the thing I think that salvation, you have to believe in salvation of one form or another. I believe it does exist. Uh, and technology is part of it. I just don't have faith that uh, the form, the, the current form of capitalist technological innovation can redeem itself. And it all comes down to, to faith. It all comes down to None of it can be rationally reckoned with. And the attempt to do so drives you crazy. And why do we do that? Why do we why do we why did we make it so that things have to be fully rational? It's to ground us, right? It's to ground us somewhere. But being grounded means nothing if you can't move. You have to also be able to move. And rationality hits a bedrock that cannot be resolved. Uh, and leaves a, a, a vacantness that has to be filled. Uh, and then you can either try to positively fill it or try to move around it. And that was what I did for the vast majority of my life, is I just moved around this hole, and it just got worse and worse with time. All right, this is probably long enough. I don't want to get it too long. I know poor Chris has to watch these whole bullshit things to put them onto YouTube. Thank you, Chris. I know you put up with a lot of my gums flapping, I'm sure. I'm, I'm amazed that you, like, ever want to hang out with me in, in real life, that you'd ever want to hear my stupid voice again. But I love you, buddy. And I love all of you, one way, abstractly. You know, you know what I mean. Anyway, take it sleazy. <laughs>